Welcome everyone to episode one. We're going to discuss in a series of episodes, fat grafting, what led to fat grafting, what products were used. These products were biomaterials initially. So we'll get into all of that. I'm Dr. Whitfield. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon in Austin, Texas. I look forward to sharing all of this with you in a series of episodes. I felt compelled to do this because I get asked questions all the time about fat grafting. So let's talk about augmentation in general. And, you know, basically the psychology of this was to enhance the breast. There are a variety of reasons uh, for breast enhancement and the loss of volume after pregnancy causing breast involution. Um, that can be a main driver. Um, the current norms and cultures, depending on the era you're talking about can drive the desire for breast enhancement. There's economic incentives depending on uh, where you are, uh, and particularly the, the time uh, in history you were in. So let's dive into this first episode and learn about the first biomaterial. So what was injected first was paraffin. The earliest reports of paraffin being injected were not for cosmetic breast augmentation. It was for um, really to help uh, a young man who had had a testicular uh, operation to be able to pass a physical for the military. Now, shortly after that was done uh, by Dr. Robert Gersony in Austria, it was then picked up and started uh, to be used for breast enhancement. So, okay, what is paraffin? Uh, paraffin is able to be injected because it can be liquefied uh, after it's heated to about 47 to 65 degrees centigrade. And then once you inject it, it becomes firm in, in the body and moldable, if you will. So this was done approximately from the 1890s to 1914. Now, you, you've got to ask, like, why was this abandoned? What was the problem? And so initially it was fine, but over the course of time, it could have and lead to a chronic inflammatory process. So this is going to be a theme. Um, our body likes the tissues in terms of uh, recognizing what we call self and uh, that allows you know your own body's immune system to check everything that gets introduced into the environment think of like a splinter if you got a splinter stuck in your finger it would get red and irritated around that splinter and that's because it's not your tissue it's foreign if you left it in there it would form a chronic inflammatory reaction around it including but not limited to a granuloma. It could get infected. It may get ulcerated. It may need to be drained. All these things can happen. That's just the simplest way to think about it. So now we're taking a foreign substance that is got to be liquefied under heat, inject it, and then it firms up beneath the tissue. So your body's immediately going to recognize that as foreign. And the process of extrusion of that, which is what's going to happen, your body's going to try to get rid of it. It could lead to ulceration, tissue necrosis, ultimately infection, fistulas, drainage, all sorts of problems, ultimately requiring probably uh, not just a lumpectomy or partial removal of where that was, but it would lead to mastectomy and disfigurement because of this. So in the West, it was largely abandoned by the 1920s in terms of use as a product to to inject. So let's, you know, let's summarize this. So enhancement is desired, whether it's on the, uh, the, the patient side for, you know, the reasons of postpartum, um, patient's breast volume is lost after breastfeeding and they want to restore that volume. Mind you, you know, lifting and things are not done at this time. And then there's also this economic situation. So uh, that's, uh, we can delve into that. That's an interesting 
uh, topic in, uh, especially in Asia, where this was practiced into the 60s. So I guess we'll transition uh, and, and talk about that. All right, so paraffin gets abandoned. There's all these other substances then that get utilized. And so we're just going to break it down and list them because some of them are completely, uh, they're a little bizarre. But um, I guess at that time, you have to work with what you had. So things like ivory balls, glass balls, vegetable oil, mineral oil, lanolin, beeswax, epoxy resin, ground rubber, ox cartilage, and even goat's milk. Now, there are things that are going to be um, discussed later, and uh, I'm going to leave some of those uh, to the next episode so we can go in a orderly fashion to discuss you know, yeah, these things uh, to me are just like, they're very bizarre. Um, the introduction of fat into the equation came uh, by Dr. Victor uh, Zerny in um, 1895. So he transplanted a lipoma from a patient's uh, buttocks to reconstruct um the breast after loss of volume from a tumor resection. So this was the earliest documentation of fat graft that I could find used, uh, but this was being used for reconstructive purposes, obviously. And this was the patient's own tissue. Now, <clears throat> volumes of tissue that are, are transposed like this have to heal. So let's let's just you know take a moment to understand that. So any amount of tissue in the body transported from one area to another has to heal. So um, I always use this as an example to explain tolerance. So Joseph Murray uh, was the last surgeon to win the Nobel Prize for performing a kidney transplant in Siamese twins. And so he hooked up an artery, a vein, and the tube that drains um, the kidney to the bladder, the ureter. He showed that technically that operation could be done, and it could be done because it was the patient's own tissue, and it was revascularized. So if you just took the kidney and hooked up the uh, tube that drained the kidney to the bladder, it wouldn't produce urine because there's no flow because it's not alive. The minute you take it, uh, from the, the donor, which was a Siamese twin, and place it in the new patient. Or if you placed a uh, uh, any type of transplant in the patient, it has to revascularize or it has to have the blood supply hooked up for it to actually work. So in the laboratory models, it takes about 21 days for a flap or a composite of tissue to revascularize. And that's been known for a, a long period of time. <clears throat> And so when we're looking at these early uses of fat, uh, fat transfers, any type of injection has to heal. And in um, 1912, Eugene Hollander described injecting adipose tissue into the breast, and he was using it to uh, correct contour deformities, which has been used for long periods uh, of time. But always remember Okay, what do we need to heal something? So free from any type of infection. Okay, can't can't be infected; it won't heal. Um, has to be placed in an area where it can heal. So um, much like going back to Doctor uh, Murray, he transposed a kidney, but he hooked up the blood supply, obviating kind of the the placement issue. So if you're not doing that, for instance, and we're using fat and we're putting it in a space, what is the desired space that that should go? Well, it should be with other fat in the subcutaneous fat plane. So the, the plane of fat all over the body is beneath the skin. 
if you were to peel back uh, layers of tissue and go through the top of the skin, down through the deeper layers of the skin, and then get to the next layer, that would be fat. That is where the fat belongs. It doesn't belong typically um, in the next level of tissue. You, you could, and it has been uh, done in the past, but say for instance, when we're trying to do an enhancement of breast volume or buttock volume, we're placing it in the subcutaneous fat plane. So not in the breast tissue, because that can lead to other problems, and not into the muscular tissue, which can lead potentially to other problems. We want to avoid uh, hitting um, anything that could cause a problem with bleeding or other issues. So think of, uh, and the easy analogy I tell uh, to my clients and I explain to my team is, Think of the pocket on the front of a shirt. You can only fill that pocket so much, and the front of the pocket is like the skin, and then the fat goes in the pocket, and then the back of the pocket is the, if you want to think of the imaginary plane between the breast tissue. So you don't want to violate that plane. You want to avoid it because you want to augment the fatty plane. That's where fat belongs. It doesn't belong inside the breast. It'll create cysts. And then there will be, and we'll discuss in detail why fat transfers should work. But always, it's always the same tenets. Fat from the same person transposed to another area in the same person can heal. Think of it has to go in the right place, has to have a proper blood supply, Patient has to have proper nutrition. Paper has to, uh, patient has to have proper recovery. And uh, recovery is always, uh, first and foremost, secondary to uh, sleep. We, we um, rest and digest uh, at night when we sleep, so proper sleep is paramount. Obviously, adequate levels of hormones. Um, fat will be very sensitive to uh, hormones. So there's all sorts of factors that go into transposition of fat from one area to another. And I give credit to really all of these uh, very early pioneers um, of, of fat transfer. It, it was uh, clearly something from a project wise to take, uh, take on at that time was very daunting. And um, I really look forward to this next episode. So, in the next episode, we're going to talk about something that seems, you know, a little off kilter, but I'll just uh, tease it this way. Um, we go from injecting these uh, liquids to using a synthetic implant, but it's not a breast implant. Not a breast implant.